This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today is my special guest, uh, former UFC heavyweight champion, former king of Pancrase openweight champion, former world nogi, Brazilian jiu-jitsu champion, and in pro wrestling, he's competed in New Japan for Antonio Noki's IGF promotion and Impact Wrestling. He's also done color commentary for New Japan and a whole lot of other stuff. The war master himself, Josh Barnett. How are you doing today, sir? Ah, doing pretty good. Well, it's an honor to have you on here. You're also one of the trainers of Davy Boy Smith Jr., who recently re-debuted in WWE. What did you think about that? Uh, <clears throat> wasn't the total surprise. And I remember the first time you went to the WWE, uh, we before he had fully committed to that one uh first on the first go we got done with training and we sat down in a in the, in the hot tub after training uh and we just talked about the pros and cons of signing with the wwe way way back when uh when it was him and natty and tj uh, would eventually be with the heart dynasty and and you know even then he was like well i don't know what should i do and so we chatted about it and um you know, he, he went to the WWE the first time and, and even in regards to, to going back this time, I mean, it's hard to deny the, the opportunities that it brings you. Um, but with those opportunities means you have to lose some. And, and some of that means, of course, I won't be able to use them for blood sport, which is, to be honest, not it's, it, it, uh, you know, I guess that's just a personal problem, but um, that's really not a big deal in the long, long term scheme of things. But I guess uh, the only thing that I would have thought uh, or the, the thing that really just sticks in the back of my mind is we had talked about uh, putting him in the MMA ring and he had interest. And I had a few places that had talked about had, had inquired. So I would have liked to have um, taken him through that whole process. But uh, uh, Harry's in a great place. So uh, I, I know he's going to really make something of this 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 next time here in the WWE. He had been training in MMA for years, I believe, over a decade. Are you surprised that he didn't give at least one fight a shot, or was there just too much money for him in wrestling to risk getting hurt in MMA? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm a little surprised we hadn't put one together, but uh, with the life of a professional wrestler, even when you're in the WWE, there is a certain amount of chaos that comes with it that's just – hard to uh, uh, hard to avoid uh, because it's such a, an active and constantly moving uh, landscape. So as an indie wrestler on his own, it was even that much more chaotic. And because he had a name coming from well, the legacy of, of his, his father and the hearts and all that, and his time already spent in the WWE, um, it's tough to just, you, you just can't, throw him in any fight because there's always the, the factor that you you're worth a decent amount of money because of your prior uh, notoriety. Um, also people are going to look to often just use you as a sacrificial lamb for someone that they figure is, that they, they really want to get behind, let's say, because they're going to bring you in, pay you money just to build the other guy up. And it's, it's difficult to, to have to navigate those waters. So when, when uh, uh, Phil CM Punk even went to the UFC, uh, I even, I talked to him about that and I said, you know, Phil, it's not like you had much of an option because uh, the only other thing you could have done was to go fight in secret. You know, if that was all that it was, uh, but as far as uh, being involved in any of the business element of, of, of anything in combat sports, you'd have to go to the biggest place and get the biggest payday and, and, you know, deal with the difficulty that's going to come from, from being someplace like the UFC. And it would be the same for Harry, but uh, I really felt that Harry would have been able to have asserted himself just fine and he would have enjoyed it. But uh, also the, the, my other caveat was always that if he was going to go and fight, he had to be out here with me, uh, overseeing his training the whole time, and that's really difficult to do uh, with with all the um, uh, uh, 
responsibilities towards all his bookings and and when he was flying to Japan and, and wrestling in New Japan or anywhere else he was going, you know. For yourself with WWE, you've had quite a successful wrestling career that we'll get into later. Was it just that you didn't want to give up MMA and kind of sign your life away over to WWE to work there? Well, yeah. I mean, I kept um, signing with companies uh, where there was no flexibility to go to the WWE, especially as far as the WWE is concerned, because their contracts are also very um, uh, airtight for the most part. And, and with the kind of restrictions that uh, would be necessary for either to, to, you know, to, to bring anybody on board like myself, uh, it just makes it that much more difficult. Plus, you know, early on in wrestling, I really didn't have any interest in trying to wrestle in the WWE or anything like that. Uh, I liked what I was doing in Japan. And that was really more in line with what I was interested to do as a professional wrestler and the way I wanted to approach it. But, um, I mean, at this point, who knows? I mean, anything could happen, but I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm doing in wrestling at the moment. And, uh, I, I'm really happy to see all the, the athletes, uh, that I'm working with getting their shots, uh, over at the WWE or AEW or wherever they're ending up. Yes. And for those that don't know, you've taken over blood sport, which is, kind of a mix between the more MMA style of wrestling, but instead of a cage, you're doing a ring with no ropes. Um, can you explain how you started uh, your involvement with that promotion? Simply, it was just some emails from Brett Lauderdale. So uh, they uh, he had asked me to wrestle on the first blood sport that they did with Matt Riddle, and there was a, a conflict uh, in terms of the dates, so I, I just couldn't make it. And then um, that show went off, did uh, did pretty well, and it was a nice debut uh, for, for the company, for GCW with it. And then Matt Riddle got picked up to WWE. And since doing Matt Riddle doing Bloodsport anymore wasn't a, a possibility, uh, Brett reached out to me to see if I would be the one or if I'd be interested in, in having it be a uh, you know, my name above title. And I said, yeah, but if I'm doing this, I have to be involved in producing it, booking it, agenting it, so on and so forth. You know, I want to completely, I want to do this entirely under my auspice. And he said, sure. Okay. And uh, that's also why with Bloodsport, I consider my Josh Barnett's Bloodsport to be distinct and separate from, from Matt Riddle's uh, because it is completely and utterly uh, under my you know, design and vision and things. Uh, so I, I feel like they're, while they may seem they're similar in some ways, they're, they're different in many others. And I, I, I love it. I love the opportunity to bring my knowledge uh, in terms of putting together a show uh, to work with Brett and to present the shows to the audience, but also to have the opportunity to bring in athletes that I that I see something in, that I, I see uh, may, maybe they're not as big on the indie scene as other guys, but I see something in them that I think is really unique and notable. And it also gives me the opportunity to just work with a wide variety of people uh, to give them some pointers and tips and help and uh, have a little bit of my guiding hand to, to see what I can bring out of them. You had John Moxley on a recent one fighting against Harry Smith, who we were just talking about. Uh, are you planning on using bigger names like John Moxley as much as possible, as well as the upcoming uh, stars that aren't signed by the bigger companies? Well, I mean, you'd have to be a fool not to. I mean, anytime you consider yourself fortunate enough to have as high profile a wrestler as Moxley to come into your show, you leap at that. And if, if those people are out there and they have the, the freedom to, to be a part of what we're doing, then yeah, I will absolutely use them. But even then just being popular, being noteworthy, doesn't mean that you're right for my show. And that's something that I think, maybe doesn't, isn't 
isn't so common, uh, commonplace at all in, in the world of wrestling as, as it is right now. Uh, there's plenty of people that I could look at that are really high level guys or high, high known names and other companies that I, I wouldn't use just simply because they're like, well, no, it's just not the right place for them. And it would be better to, to stick with, um, those that are more capable of working this style and have that right presentation and attitude and, and skill set than to put someone in there where they're not going to shine. Uh, because the point of putting these, one of the major points putting these shows together is to make great matches. And I wouldn't want to try and put someone in a place where they're going to struggle or suffer. Uh, because if, if one person's having a really terrible night, likelihood is they're going to give, they're going to make everybody in that match look bad. And so there's no point for that. Would there ever be a chance, uh, given your relationship with Jim Ross, that you and Jim Ross would commentate a blood sport together? Oh, uh, I mean, I guess it's kind of like, uh, you know, that scene in Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I mean, so you're saying there's a chance. There is a chance, but, um, you know, he's a, he's a high level dude with a lot going on. And I, I wouldn't want to call in that favor just to get him to do the show. I would really love to get to a point where I could properly you know, pay someone like Jim to come in if it was available and, uh, you know, and, and give some love back to, uh, a man that, that helped me out a lot in the, the realm of color commentary through, you know, just little bits and pointers and also by example, by seeing what a professional he is and learning so much from him. So um, that would be wonderful to have Jim there. Uh, and we have been pretty fortunate that we have someone like Max Bredos from ESPN, well, formerly of ESPN, uh, who also does Combate Americas and He's a big wrestling fan himself growing up and leading, uh, lending his professional services. And then last show, uh, I had uh, Bulletproof, Bullet, Bulletproof Blake Troop uh, to come and sit alongside, who was, doing, who was doing a bunch of work with Dave Marquez and the championship wrestling from Hollywood. And uh, he's also on that pro wrestling training path. And he's a former MMA fighter. So it was a, it was a great mix there. And, and we're still working on... Uh, always trying to solidify our commentary. Uh, but with indie, indie wrestling, you know, we, we move and uh, we have to flow with what's available quite often. So uh, hoping to keep uh, Max along for the ride and, uh, you know, have a proper color commentary person. But uh, yeah, Jim Ross is amazing. There's a fan on here that would like to know how it was working with Minoru Suzuki in Bloodsport. It was as easy as could be. Uh, Minoru and I go back a really long ways, uh, all the way back to Pancras stuff and also uh, um, training and being on the on tour together in New Japan. And we had met each other once in a, in a tag team match. It was me and I think Masuki Naruse versus Yoshihiro Takayama and, and Minoru Suzuki. Uh, but otherwise, we... We've just been friends for a really long time and, uh, you know, we're of that, that gotch lineage as well. So we have that in common. So putting that match together was a simple matter of, all right, I'll see you out there. That's it. You know, we didn't, we don't call anything. Uh, we don't structure the match. We don't figure out, we don't have spots put together. We didn't do, we just warmed up uh, and just met in the ring. That was it. And it was uh, as fun as you could imagine. Well, maybe, maybe most people wouldn't find it very fun to be uh, in a ring with Minoru Suzuki. But uh, I, I thought it was incredible. And if I get more opportunities to wrestle uh, Minoru, I would in a heartbeat. Uh, he is fantastic. And to me, he is a he's an incredible example of what an old school pro wrestler uh, used to be. And uh, I really appreciate him. Is it true with blood sport, if somebody doesn't necessarily want to lose, that you'll let them have a, a shoot grappling match to decide if 
uh, the other guy could actually beat him, and if he could, you would let him go over? And has that actually happened? Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah, I, that would be something I would do actually. And it, uh, I, I haven't had to put any of that into into play at this point because most people are pretty amenable to um, to my vision with what we're doing. Plus, uh, I don't want anybody to lose for no reason. Generally, I, I, I mean, sometimes it, it could be just as simple as just making people flip a coin uh, or, you know, I, I, I do when when possible, try to think of things in the long term vision uh, with with having athletes being able to compete against each other more than once. But that is really tough to do, because if they're not getting if they're not getting hired by AEW, the New Japan or WWE, then it's tough to just be able to secure that next booking. You know, to know, OK, well, when, when are we going to do our next show? OK, let's solidify a venue. We got this going. OK, now can we go get, you know, so-and-so again? It's like, oh, crap. Well, no, they're actually going to be doing this show here and that show there. And so, well, I guess we'll have to work around it. But uh, um, as far as I've not really I've not really had much trouble in the aspect of anybody having a problem with who goes over and who does and, and who does the job. But uh if, if it was of a particular contention, yeah, I'll just like, well, all right, shoot then, whatever, <laughs> solve it. There's quite a few fans on here asking about, would you ever face Jake Hager in MMA or in blood sport? I know that I think he trained with you a bit at one point. Never. I've oh, never, no. I've never even, I don't even think I've even met him in real life ever. Uh, would I fight him? It would have to be just for an exorbitant amount of money and nothing else because there's, I get nothing out of beating him. Uh, and blood sport, I don't know. I mean, that'd be up to him. I mean, I'll, I'll work with anybody, and I am not angling for anything from him. I want the only thing I want is my fight with Fyodor. But beyond that, I don't know. I'm look. I'm not here to to ruin or really have any issue with Jake or his career, but he, he put himself in between me and something that, that belongs to me. So I, and, and also in a way that I didn't take very kindly to that's that. And uh, as for, you know, if, if there comes a time he wants to wrestle in blood sport, I'll try to give him the best matchup I can because uh, there's, there's no point regardless of if I think he's a, uh, an idiot or if I think he's amazing, but, uh, to, to try and, um, to try and, uh, uh, make somebody look bad or to not give them the best opportunity when that, when that ring is available to them. Yeah. I believe there was some controversy a couple weeks ago where you had spoken out against Jake, who has been publicly campaigning, to get that Fedor uh, fight, I believe it's in October in Russia. And this mm -hmm. is something that, as you said, you feel you deserve. Has there been any decision yet on who's actually going to fight him? And is it still in the realm of possibilities for you? And also, why don't you think he deserves it? Uh, well, not, I don't know uh, what the decisions, if any, have been made yet. Uh, I suppose we'll all find out. Um as to why do I think he doesn't deserve it? He's got four fights and he's fought nobody of, of really a of real note yet, which I don't blame him. He's just getting started. That makes sense. And it's not even to downplay his opponents that much because, you know, they got to get their time to get their names out there and see what, what's made of them as well. But he, uh, he insists that uh, because he is, uh, has more you know, social media followers that that therefore uh, gives him more credit to having a fight against a legend in the sport of mixed martial arts. But it, it doesn't really, it doesn't exactly work that way. Um, and I don't know even that what, what implied uh, popularity uh, that he has is actually going to translate into real numbers. The last fight he had in Bellator, wasn't it on the prelims as well? It wasn't even on the main card. 
So we couldn't uh, have that great numbers. I don't know. I mean, and, and I don't, uh, you know, I mean, that doesn't, I, that makes sense to me. And that's totally fine for someone in Jake's position. Um, and as to him fighting where and how he has up to this point, um, you know, besides getting hit in the cup and then calling it good, uh, taking that as a way out, I feel, um, okay, well, the re- other than that, uh, so what? I mean, you got to get out there and fight. He's making, he's getting the fights that seem to make sense right now. And, and he is three and oh, um, but three and oh is a long way from, from 30 fights or winning world titles or, and, and all the things that come with all that kind of experience and success in MMA. Will he ever see that? I don't know. He's pretty old, but, um, you know, props to anybody to go out there and actually get in the ring, but don't, (laughs) but don't, don't insult me and my peers who are not your peers. We are your elders. We are your, we are, we are the, uh, the veterans. We are the people, we're the guys in the locker room you would never fuck with. As far as what Fedor would be looking for in an opponent, obviously Jake would be, a uh, more likely guy he could beat. Do you think he would be looking for someone that would be more of a showcase fight? Because with you, obviously, that's a lot tougher fight. I don't know. Maybe. Um, <clears throat> it's it's hard to say. I, I think that the, the fight between me and him in Russia, even specifically, would be enormous. Uh, probably bigger than any other fight he could have uh, for the rest of his career whatever the rest of uh, the career that he wants to have is left Uh, because I'm actually pretty, pretty noteworthy and known in Russia as well. I've been over there several times uh, on my own as a special guest, as someone, a part of events and as someone bringing athletes to fight in Russia. So um, this is a fight that even the Russian fan base has been waiting to see for a long time and would really love. But at the end of the day, it's up to Fyodor and his management as well as Bellator. So uh, that's a lot of, that's a lot of people making decisions. So we'll see where that ends up. There's a fan pubert on here. He wants to know why you think Japanese MMA organizations are almost non-existent now. Uh, They're just almost non-existent to us. And that's only to those that don't know the proper, uh, I say proper, um, they don't know the, the the channels at which to to get a hold of this this um, uh, these shows and and the stuff that they're doing. It, it's it's still out there. It's still going strong. Uh, Deep has not slowed down. Uh, Heat is a bit more uh, infrequent, and they're based out of Nagoya. Shuto still going. Pancras is still having fights all the time. Um, uh, Ryzen has been picking back up, but of course, everybody's suffering from the effects of restrictions in the pandemic and all that. And that's done a, a real number on being able to put on events, period, you know, outside of uh, the UFC, which was able to spend uh, a good amount of money to put together a program to get it going. But not everybody had, was a, afforded that uh, option. So it's still good. Uh, Japanese MMA is picking up. It did. It, it has been in a big slump, and, and that big slump also uh, coincided with professional wrestling. So, um, Japanese pro wrestling was 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 really down in the numbers for a long time there, along with uh, MMA. But it's it's coming back slowly but surely, and and there's still incredible fights happening over there. You had a fight with Dan Severin fairly early on in your career. He's appeared in many interviews with me. I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on fighting him and his habits of taking a lot of fights with almost no camp. Uh, well, see, you can get away with that when you're Dan Severn because you are the epitome of a man <laughs> and and your mustache has more uh, testosterone uh, than, you know, most CrossFit gyms. So... Uh, when you're Dan Severn, you can get away with those things. And uh, fighting Dan Severn to me and on one end was a little bit of revenge for my teammates he had beaten at AMC Pancration. But also it was 
surreal because Dan Severn uh, was one of those that I looked up and idolized when I was watching the UFC. And at some point it's like, oh crap, I'm going to go, you know, you got to go fight your, fight your idols. How weird. And then I guess at some point you got to try and destroy your idols to see if you can, if you can surpass them. And Dan Severn's a class act. He's a, he's a badass guy. He was a, a monumental, absolute legend in mixed martial arts. The guy's got over a hundred victories fighting into his fifties. It's just absolutely insane that he could do that. Um, hell, he might even have a fight at 60. I don't know. Uh, I'd have to go look into his record, but um, he still even does a bit of pro wrestling here and there. And he, he wrestled against Frank Mir uh, on, on my first blood sport show, which I, I highly appreciate. And uh, I could, I don't know. I mean, I, how much more good things could I say about Dan Severn? Uh, and as a freestyle, or I should say as an amateur wrestler in the NCAA, hell of a talent. Um, Dan Severn is a, that guy's an American hero. Another legend in MMA that you fought, who you actually defeated for the UFC title, even though there was some controversy after that, was Randy Couture. Could you talk to us about that when you became the youngest UFC champion at 24? Uh, it was a great moment, and I absolutely trained my ass off for something that I didn't even know was coming around, was even uh, available to me, because to my knowledge, I... I didn't know whether or not I was even in the hunt for the title, even though I was on a winning streak and beating top guys. But, uh, uh, yeah, I got a call. I think I was, they were going to have him fight someone else. And then on, I don't remember, like six weeks or eight weeks notice, maybe after, after having arthroscopic knee surgery, they give me a ring and ask me if I'll do it. And I said, yeah. And I trained as hard as I possibly could and, the thing was, I just knew in my in my heart that I what I could bring to the table was far more than what what Randy had. But what Randy was really good at, uh, you you couldn't let him you couldn't let him start implementing uh, the control and the rhythm. Otherwise, you would just be fighting behind him the whole time. And so my thing was to just get my offense going as much as possible, no matter where we ended up. And I knew that eventually he would start playing behind. And once he started playing behind, he was going to, he was, it was going to be mine and only a matter of time. And that's exactly what happened. So, um, uh, I won the belt and it was an amazing moment, <clears throat> but a part of it felt like, well, yeah, I just felt like this is, of course I was going to win, but, you know, it just felt matter of fact, which was a, an odd feeling at the time. But in retrospect, it's just, Another thing, you know, Randy being a Washington wrestler at that. Uh, so watching him, I remember fight Vitor and just thinking, holy moly, here's a Was another Washington wrestler in the ring. And, and, you know, this is this reminds me, this makes made me think of my own path at that time and where I was striving to go. And I was elated to see him as a Washington wrestler out there representing in a way for all of us and to then be able to share the ring with them was incredible. And I had helped him prepare to fight Pedro Hizzo before. So we'd even trained together and, um, you know, it didn't have anything to do with, there was never any personal animosity. It was just a fight, but I guess I should say, yeah, I'm pretty lucky to get to, to say that I fought Randy Couture and I'm glad for that. When you went to Pride from UFC, how did you like fighting over in Japan compared to the U.S.? And what was the pay differences like? Because I understand Pride actually paid more to a lot of fighters around that time. Yeah, the upper limits of, of what you could make in Pride were, were much higher than the UFC. But the UFC wasn't necessarily uh, paying people, you know, dog scraps or anything like that they were making they were paying good money to folks too but the markets were just very different and the market in japan was just far larger um the other thing about being in japan is they accepted it as a more mainstream thing uh versus it was seen as a niche uh and even at times verboten kind of thing in and taboo in america whereas in japan it was not it was seen as a um, sport that you would you would recognize from anyone on the street and 
I like the 10 minute rules. I like the fact that you can soccer kick and knee the head of a downed opponent again. I love the more open dynamic environment, but also it felt like you were in the F1 of mixed martial arts and the best guys in the world were there in, and especially in that heavyweight division. And so if you wanted to be the best in the world, that is just where you had to be at the time. I guess around that time would have been when you first met Billy Robinson. Mm -hmm. How did that well, connection actually, happen? Actually, I met Billy uh, when I was over there with New Japan, which is where I started my foray into, into Japanese fighting and wrestling was through New Japan Pro Wrestling. And um, I had I would go to the snake pit to see Miyato-san and uh, Billy had been on vacation for a minute, but then when he came back, I would, I, I got to meet him. We got along really well. And I, he, I just kept coming in and he just kept having me. So, uh, as much as I was there, he would, uh, he would give me all of his attention and help me with any little thing he could. And, um, even when I wasn't living in Japan anymore, but I was traveling there pretty much every other month. I would, if we're in Tokyo, I would do all my my pre-fight finishment finishing stuff uh, at the Snake Pit with Billy. Um, it was it was again just like you just never know where your life is going to lead you. And being able to have Billy Robinson as your coach for as many years as I did, and working with me it was uh, it's incredible. I don't know. I don't know how you end up in these things other than to shoot your shot. And if you're lucky, it works out. So uh, I'm really fortunate for that. And it was a really amazing experience. And through him, through my friendship with Miyato, I met uh, Billy. And through Billy and Miyato, I met uh, Hideki Suzuki, who I've had the opportunity to wrestle as well as train over the years. And now he's in the WWE. And so, uh, you know, we just, uh, Billy's boys just keep showing up. I don't know if you've heard this, but there's a popular interview of Sergeant Slaughter online where he claims that he had a shoot with Billy Robinson and he mopped the floor with him basically uh, in the AWA training camp. Have you heard this interview and do you think there's any possibility that that could have actually happened? No, I've never heard the interview. No, I don't think it happened. You know, what's wrestling without without people uh, overselling themselves? <laughs> you also had a submission victory over Andre Arlovsky, another MMA legend. Could you talk to us about that fight? Yeah, well, uh, strange. It was, a, it was a good match. It was one long in the making. I was supposed to fight him for a, affliction for the second card. Well, it's, that's a whole nother story. I mean, I, I said to, to, to those guys, because um, I know it, for some reason, this is still not that widely known, but I was a part of the formation of Affliction MMA from the first show. I actually booked some of the fights that are on that card and some of the structure and production of that came from me and athletes that were brought to that show came from me like Fedor. Um, but uh I said, well, yeah, well, let's stay here in Southern California and lock this area down and uh, UFC can have Vegas and uh, we don't, there's no reason for us to, to be in their territory. It'll, and most of the people at, at UFC shows and all that are all traveling from somewhere else to Vegas, especially Southern California. So why? And yet all of a sudden it's like, okay, next show, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do the, uh, what is the name of that place? The, uh, the UNLV's. Uh, big arena that they have and I'm just like damn that's a dumb idea <laughs> and sure enough yeah I mean everything that you could think of uh, if you went into enemy territory could happen and there was no way that that show was going to go anywhere and eventually they had to cancel the show and then they wanted to move some of the fights onto an Elite XC card and, and then as soon as the show started falling apart I was like well I, I got stuff to do and so then they went and got Roy Nelson to, to fight uh, Andre, and I guess he still had some sort of beef with that. Um, it was interesting. I didn't. I didn't think he had ever had any ill will towards me. But uh, in any case, yeah, a little bit of it came out in the pre-fight stuff. And I was like, well, all right. You know, he did want to fight you, and 
at least for me, part of it was when we were over in, in Pride, um, um, Andre was the UFC champion, and they would, of course, as they're supposed to do, um, promote him as the number one guy in the world and the best guy out there and, and uh, you know, better than anybody else. And, you know, back then, um, us in Pride, we would just say, no, that's no way. Uh-uh. The, the UFC guys can't hang with us. And for me, fighting Andre in the UFC at that time was a revisit back to that argument of well, who had the better heavyweights, Pride or the UFC. Um, so there was some history in that sense. But as far as just a uh, personal matchup, man, it was, it was awesome to be in the ring with him and to fight him. Uh, he, he showed me some things that I didn't expect. And uh, at the end of the day, I got the submission uh, from, uh, from the, uh, the sleeper hold, a short choke. And yeah, it was just, a, it was a blast. It was a good time out there getting in the ring with someone who's, uh, who's been in the, the, the sport as long as he has. You also defeated Roy Nelson, another guy that I've interviewed. Any memories of that fight? And and why do you think as hard as he trains, he always kept the belly? Is it just his genetics? I'm sure genetics probably has something to do with it and probably diet. But, uh, um, you know, there's even something to be said, though. Maybe there is a certain weight that would include him having that extra, that extra body fat that – has him at his maybe he's not the fastest he could be uh maybe his cardio is not at the greatest it could be but his his power and his his strength and with coupled with uh adequate speed and uh capable endurance was his best place and i don't know what that is you know i don't i don't live in roy nelson's body thank god but uh uh what was it like fighting him i it was it was cool uh my game plan was to outbox him, and I did that. Um, I fought him southpaw, which was a big surprise to everyone, but it was the thing that kept me the farthest from his right hand, which was um, the thing that he was going to lean on whenever things got tough. And I was surprised he he took me down a few times. I just really never even considered it. But, you know, once we're there, it was like, well, what are we going to do now? And uh, other than one takedown where he sort of kind of laid on me a bit, and he wasn't particularly heavy, but he was very good at, at just sort of covering, trying to cover all the points that uh, on your body to use to, to try and get up. But in being on top, he he spent a lot of effort into trying to stop me from going places and not so much in trying to attack. And so by, I think the second time he took me down, I even, or whatever, I transitioned right into his leg, which he had to, he ran off uh to escape the leg lock and this is i'm just thinking if you keep if we keep going down here i will get a hold of you and i'll submit you here but if we if we stay on the feet then you know maybe you feel like you got a better opportunity but you know who knows uh but at the end of the day uh, i set a record for significant strikes in the heavyweight division and i think strikes up against the cage or something like that and the uh, japanese audience was super stoked and yeah turned out to be a great fight when they started having you do pro wrestling over in Japan, was that something that you embraced or did you just do that for a paycheck and weren't really interested at first? Uh, no, it was something that I tracked down. Uh, I saw that uh, a friend and old training partner, Siyoshi Kosaka, was doing stuff in uh, New Japan. So I emailed him and I said, hey, man, get me a uh, get me a. a uh, and a, a, a meeting with these guys. I, I really want to go over there and wrestle. I would love to be a professional wrestler. Uh, it's been a lifelong dream of mine, and I'm a huge professional wrestling fan. And I was able to sit down with reps from New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Enoki was down with it. And Uai and Kawana uh, met with me, and they're like, okay, yeah, we'll we'll offer you we'll 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 offer you a deal that that has some caveats. So if you don't live up to what we think you can do, we can we can end the contract. But okay, good to go. You're gonna wrestle Yuji Nagata. But Jesus, uh, okay, well I'll 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 be there, man. I'll I'll show up. And after two days of training together, that was it. We went in there and wrestled for twelve minutes in the Tokyo Dome, man. It was it was wild and. Uh, uh, it was a it was a hell of a start 
to a professional wrestling career, wrestling somebody that you watched on WCW and seen New Japan tapes, uh, who is just the epitome of, of, of a strong style wrestler, and then being able to be in there and, and vie for the that IWGP title. It was an incredible experience. And to me, being a professional wrestler was about representing the entirety of it, the shooting and the working. And that's why when the opportunity to do these MMA fights in, in New Japan came about, I was fully on board. I helped set up the cards. I cr helped create the rules. Um, and for me, it was an opportunity to bring the New Japan Pro Wrestling flag to the ring to show that, uh, you know, I wasn't there about any country, but I was there to represent professional wrestling. And, uh, you know, I have carried that all the way throughout, throughout everything I've done here. And to the point that back in the day in strike force, they'd always want to ask you, you know, what your style was or what have you to put on the, uh, the, the words, the, whatever title cards that they were going to put up for, um, for well, on your entrances. And so I would always put pro, pro wrestling, and often they would change it to mixed martial arts, but I always put pro wrestling and I always represented myself as a, a an athlete from professional wrestling. I mean, that is my lineage. Uh, even a lot of my fight stuff came down the line from the shoot wrestling uh, lineage from Gotch and Billy Robinson and training under Billy. And, and then, you know, the peripherals from people like Matt Hume, and Eric Paulson that also go down through that same shoot wrestling lineage and even getting a little bit of time to train under Carl Gotch. So to me, it's, it's about keeping something like that alive. How was the pay for new Japan compared to pride? Was it similar? No, uh, completely different structure, but the pay was great. New Japan paid very well. And it was, uh, they, they took great care of their athletes too. You team with Perry Saturn a little bit in Japan. How was that? And have you heard anything from him lately? Because I don't think too many people have seen him over the past few years. No, I, I haven't heard anything from Perry for a very long time. But uh, I, I was a fan of Perry Saturn's, seeing him in ECW and WCW uh, when he was a part of the Eliminators. And then I think he was, yeah, it was just him in WCW. Uh Hey, Perry was great. Uh, he was such an easy guy to work with, always open to, to sharing his experience and his knowledge with me. And um, uh, the other thing that was uh, incredible is that he would, he would ask me to, uh, to teach him things at times and show him stuff and, and like, okay, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a 24 year old kid, but you know, I, I, I do have a lot to, uh, uh, to, to offer in terms of wrestling. And, but to think that a guy who had been such a veteran of the business would say, all right, yeah, no, I recognize that, you know, show me, show me some stuff. And it was, it was incredible. And uh, Perry was a, a great, a great person to, to team me up with, to help break me into the, to the sport and teach me things. And Mike Barton and uh, uh, Christopher Daniels uh, helped out as well, you know, just giving me pointers and helping me with different little things and, and, from there, you know, being on tour, you get access to incredible talent. Uh, you know, every day when you can say, oh, well, you know, you know Liger is, is, is training under me and, and catch wrestling and teaching me how to sell. And Eugene Nagata is talking to me and teaching me about his experience with Greco. We're training together every day, doing takedowns and wrestling drills. And he's, he's teaching me about, uh, you know, how to structure matches and different things. And Masa Chono is just coming in and, okay, here, I see you. You're kind of trying to run ropes. Well, here, let me show you. And Perry Saturn's here's how I whip a guy. So it, it was just, it was awesome. And when it, I, I have to believe that by how, how Perry perceived me helped and how others would then perceive me and help me too. You wrestled Don Fry in the IGF promotion over in Japan. How was that? And also, when I interviewed Don, he said that the Japanese fighters would try and take advantage of him from time to time, and he actually got more hurt in wrestling than MMA due to that. Um, maybe you could tell us, too, if you have ever had any experiences with that. Uh, well, wrestling Don was was fun in a sense, but also it was a little stressful because 
Uh, Don had a hurt left shoulder at that point. And, you know, um, it was, it was, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to put this match together and I got to make sure to work around and not hurt Don. At the same time, my dad, who, uh, you know, it's a long story about that, uh, fight against Randy, but there was a really obnoxious fan who was just being a real asshole. And my dad and my brother-in-law stood up to, to tell him to shut the hell up. Uh, eventually, after after the guy was being a real antagonist, and Don Fry was sitting there with my parents, and he stood up and he he told the guy that he better sit down as well. And so my dad's like, "Well, you better not hurt Don Fry, or I'll kick your ass." Like, no, Dad, I'm not going to hurt Don. I'm going to do everything I can. And uh, you know, I mean. Don's Don's cardio was a little rough, uh, or maybe I was just working a little fast, but either way, um, it was still fun as hell to be in the ring. And we got into, uh, I was going after an Achilles lock on him and he sat up and whacked me upside the head and popped my eardrum. <laughs> so I hear this, just the sound of, of air whooshing through, uh, my right ear. Uh, thankfully it wasn't bad enough, that bad. So it healed up, but, um, I, it was awesome. And Don's, I've known Don for, uh, I knew Don for, for many years before that. And, uh, uh, it's, it's always fun to get to do stuff with your, with your friends. Um, and Don was a, a great wrestler in new Japan. And, and when I was there in new Japan pro wrestling or in IGF, I never really had anybody try and take advantage. Um, Suzukawa could be particularly reckless at times. Uh, and he did cut me with a, a headbutt. Uh, in the middle of a match, but uh, I gave him a good receipt uh, from a mounted elbow and lit him open too. And then, yeah, yeah, all good. You also wrestled Tank Abbott over in Japan, and he was a pretty good heel in WCW and in UFC. How was that experience? Uh, again, you get to wrestle your friends. <laughs> it's always going to be fun. Uh, I don't know how that match turned out. Um you know, Tank showed up, and and the thing is, when you just you don't know when they got the call, how that even came together, you know. So you just work with what you got. And Tank was easy to work with, a good dude, and um, yeah, he. I think I also benefited because guys like Tank and Don, they're like, well, yeah, Josh is going to take care of you. Like I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to do anything. Um, to take liberties out of these guys and they know I'm going to look after them because even though we're, we're peers in a sense, uh, I look upon them as, as my elders and, and, and guys, big brothers to take care of. So it was fun. Uh, the most fun about wrestling tank was just, there was a match that was going to happen on that show. I think it was Kendo caution versus someone. Maybe it was those two, but anyways, it was going to turn into a, just like a, a full on crazy slug fest. So they built up this thing at the, uh, the Inoki bar press conference. And so we had these couple rooms where they would separate the cards and I'm sitting in a room. I think I was sitting in the room with tank of all things. I mean, we're going to compete against each other. So, uh, and those two dudes are like, okay, yeah, we're going to get into a, a scuffle out in the, the area in the main area. So, okay. Scuffle it, hardly at all. It was a full knockdown, knock everything off the, off the tables, knock tables over. Some dude comes blasting through the door we're at and knocks it off the hinges and they're fighting in front of all of us. And tanks just like, okay, well, <laughs> uh, seems a bit much for a promo, but okay. All right. <laughs> and at one point he's like, I didn't know if I, they're going to land right in my lap. <laughs> You also wrestled Bob Sapp. How was he as a pro wrestler? Uh, Bob is Bob is Bob's only deficit. And uh, he could, in MMA, if he had really had wanted to, he could have been one of the greatest, if not the greatest, super heavyweight fighter of all time. And uh, in terms of wrestling, uh, he's capable of putting together awesome matches. Uh, if you, it's all up to Bob and in training, Bob, uh, I've seen insane strength and athleticism for someone uh, of an, of, of a size that shouldn't exist. I've seen cardio from a guy that, that as, as big as he is, shouldn't exist. And his affinity his striking was, was a bit difficult for him. He, 
I know people know what they think of as Bob now, but even back then, Bob, Bob can take a punch if he wants to. Um, it's a, it was a little harder for him to pick up that, but grappling came to him like, like a fish to water. Um, and even complex and complicated maneuvers, he was really able to put them together. And so uh, I think Bob's best element would have been mostly as a grappler. But, uh, you know, it, it, I guess whatever it was that was required for, for fighting, uh, it just, Bob decided it wasn't, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze and he wasn't going to put that kind of effort into it. And, you know, it, it's just up to him. But the, the potential uh, in Bob was incredible. It really was. What's your opinion on these videos that have come out in recent years? I don't know if they're from Japan or where, but Bob's getting beat by these small, overweight fighters. And it, uh, it seems like it's a work, but I don't know. I don't know, man. It's when you go out there, whatever you decide to do, you're the one who ultimately has to live with it. So um, I guess that's just, it's, it's up to him. That's all I can say. Uh, I don't, I don't speculate on. I don't. I don't even. It's just, I think it's. It seems unfortunate, but if if uh, if it's fine by him, then I you know I guess then then that's the the ultimate arbiter of of what to do there, whether or not it's bad or good for him. You wrestled Bobby Lashley a couple of times. I, I think I saw your match that you had with him on Impact. Now he's gone on to, to be at the top of his game right now, WWE champion. Uh, what are your thoughts on him and how he did in MMA? He had a pretty good record overall. Yeah. Um, I think our match in Japan is better than our one in Impact. Uh, I hate watching that Impact match, but whatever. Uh, I, I'm still... Op, op, uh, I'm still glad to to always be able to share the ring with Bob. Um, I think Bobby is uh, an incredible talent, and seeing him as the champion uh, seems exactly where he should be. I really do see Bobby as a top guy wherever you put him, and he is he's a shooter and a worker. He he's such a he's a good dude, easy to work with. Um, as far as fighting is concerned, he. Whenever I was in his corner, he was undefeated. <laughs> and we had a lot of good training camps together. Uh, killer athlete. He would also meet me out at the Air Force Academy when I would go there to train for like a couple two-week camps and things like that. And Bobby would come down and hit the mats with us. And Bobby has been uh, a great friend for many years. He's lent his, his experience and expertise to help people like Eric Hammer uh, who he's wrestled over in IGF and to my student, Shayna Baszler and anybody around me, you know, all of my team and you know, Bobby is part of, you know, Bob, Bob is, is part of the family. He's part of this whole thing that we do. And when it comes to fighting and training and all that, you know, he's, he's right there with us. A lot of people have suspected that he may or may not have, somehow fought on uh, performance enhancing drugs. Uh, how do you respond to that? Is he just a naturally jacked up guy? I, I don't give a shit. I really couldn't care less to try and speculate upon things that I don't have the knowledge of. And it doesn't, it doesn't affect me in one way or the other. Um, if, if that's where people want to spend their time and energy, then I, I guess they're free to. But uh, uh, I can say that he really loves the peanut butter jealousy burger from from Slater's 5050. Say that much. He loves that thing. And I don't blame him. And as strange as it sounds, putting peanut butter on a hamburger, on a cheeseburger, is actually really good. And one of your most recent fights, I don't know if it was your last fight or not, it may have been, was the KSW bare knuckle victory that you had. I think that was in front of a pretty big crowd. Uh, that KSW seems to be doing great for crowds. What do you think the secret is over there? And how did you like that bare knuckle fight? Uh, I loved it. And and the fact that it was bare knuckle and traveling halfway across the world, like some sort of uh, 90s B movie 
or Street Fighter II character is exactly the kind of thing that that in, in, encouraged me or influenced me to get into mixed martial arts in the first place. So um, doing something that that brought the sense of adventure to it was exactly what I wanted. And I, I was really thankful to have a great opponent and a great opera, a great place to, to, to have this fight. Uh, KSW, those guys, they took um, Halidolf uh, to Dream or Sengoku. And they had, uh, the owners had been to Pride shows. So they took that, that element from how the shows were produced and then they they what would you call it they localized it to the polish audience and it has done incredible things for them uh they are one of the top promotions in the world and they're having some of the biggest gates out there um they may actually ha have the second or highest gate out or they may even have uh, had bigger shows than the ufc has had still to this point uh, and I think it's fantastic that they're out there uh, in Europe putting these shows on, putting a great show together. Uh, and they took great care of me. And um, I was really happy with my time over there with, uh, with KSW. You were in a movie with Steven Seagal. What was mm -hmm. that experience like? That had to have been pretty cool. <laughs> uh, just more childhood experiences coming, coming to life. Uh, I remember watching all the Steven Seagal stuff as a kid. And being such a fan and then one day you end up in a movie with him and uh for my my role was to uh um my, my role was basically to help give the, the the sidekick his his hero moment and so i as the the right hand man of the bad guy ends up fighting the right hand man of steven seagal and you know byron man and i had had pretty good chemistry and we put together a pretty killer fight scene and uh, Ron Balicki was, was there as one of the stunt actors and uh, fight coordinators. And he just let me put together uh, whatever I was going to do. Well, and, and uh, La, Lash Lauro was also there as a fight coordinator. And it was a, it was a great, a great group of people. Um, Keone Waxman's a, a good director. Um, he is really, good about getting what he needs out of those those really short shooting dates and setting up those cameras to to get two shots at once uh for his editor and um he's he's a pro at doing this stuff ben dang the producer was as accommodating as can be and you know i had some interesting conversations with with steven and uh being in romania for 18 days is also a great experience uh bucharest is a beautiful city and the transylvanian countryside is absolutely gorgeous there's so many cool castles and forts and stuff out there um i love all that old historical stuff last question here from a fan they want to know how you felt about seattle being taken over by antifa for a while there as obviously you're from that area uh i don't appreciate anybody destroying communities or tearing things apart or or trying to tyrannically impose themselves onto anybody so you know i'm not down to see capitol hill turned into a trash heap or, or anything like of that matter and um there's a lot of smart capable talented people uh let, let's just stick with seattle uh that we could be doing a whole lot better than than how things are going uh as it is over there and you know, I'm not seeing, you know, much in the way of what anyone would call progress in that city. I just see entropy, and that's unfortunate. But uh, I think that the the Northwest, you know, has a, a rich history um, from the people that came over there and settled in and built up some of these in uh, massive uh, cities and 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 structures with the logging industry and other things like that. But we have uh, a deep native american lineage to incredible tribes out there some that had were never colonized and never conquered um so i, I just think that there's a good spirit in the pacific northwest you know from from the original people there to even those those of us that grew up there so i i'm always hopeful for for something great to to emerge i know you have a lot of projects going on blood sport 
I, Did you say projects? <laughs> well, what would you call uh, them? Well, projects. Project. Oh, well, I am Canadian. I don't know if it's an accent. I know, so. I know. Oh, that's all right. You know, you got double double, right? You, you know, <laughs> a little bit, ca- a little bit of caffeine rushing through your veins. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's espresso actually. So I'll let you uh, discuss whatever you want to plug at this point. This is mainly a wrestling channel, so I'm sure a lot of the fans on here want to check out Bloodsport. Well, yeah, I have no doubt that uh, Bloodsport is probably what most people uh, watching this uh, would be interested in. And we are going to have uh, more Bloodsport shows, and we're working on a Bloodsport 7, and hopefully we'll be able to announce something within the next couple weeks. Um, And as for all my other projects, you know, Warbringer Whiskey is doing fantastic, although we're doing our best to try and meet the production rate, uh, trying to meet the production wants uh, for the rest of the people out there. We're working on more distribution and uh, getting in more more bars, more places. But uh, through our online system, through uh, warbringerbourbon.com, we have direct sales. And uh, Mash and Grape, who handles that for us, is, I believe, in all the lower 48. So I believe we can pretty much ship to any state at this point. And if you're if you're concerned about whether they do ship to your state, Mash and Grapes website has like an FAQ or something like that that'll tell you whether or not your state is one that they service. Um, And that's going well, although the War Master Edition, the single barrel stuff, we're still waiting, or I should say I'm still waiting to find that right barrel to to pick and to turn it into a single barrel product and put it out. But uh, as soon as these things become available, um, uh, we will let everybody know uh, ASAP. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, moving along with this, with blood sport, uh, the American catch wrestling association. So trying to put catch wrestling matches back into the, into the combat sports, uh, realm so that they're a, a more common occurrence and we can produce more catches, catch can fighters for the MMA and grappling, um, uh, oper- uh events and all my wrestlers are, are doing fantastic. So uh, you'll be seeing more of the likes of Chris Dickinson and uh, Royce Isaacs and Karen Tran out there in the world. And uh, big ups to, to Harry going back to WWE. Uh, please get a hold of Tim Thatcher and put him in a grovet for me while you're there. And I don't mean to throw this last question on you, but a few fans have asked this and I forgot to bring it up. Could you clarify what the heat with the Young Bucks is all about as we wrap this up? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I made it as clear as clear as could be on uh, on Sean Waltman's podcast, uh, Pro Wrestling for Life, not to push people to, to a different to a different stream or podcast. Uh, but it is I explained it completely. Um, and I never I never had any beef with them. Uh, and like I said, I think that there are a lot of people in their ears, uh, be it marks or who knows what. Um getting them to believe one thing versus what, how things really work. And so uh, my job and JR's job was to try and highlight the matches as much as possible. Uh, if you're a heel, which they were, they were heels to, uh, to, to, uh, emb- to, to amplify uh, what was, what made them heels and why they were bad guys. Uh, and also to put, to help so that when the heroes overcome the heels, the faces win, then, you know, there's more meaning to it. But at the same time, we weren't there to make them look bad or to seem bad. Uh, I think that's all in their head. And, uh, and I don't know, maybe it was something that they uh, created for themselves. I'm not sure. But I can say this, that they've never, ever, not once, ever come up to me and looked me in the eye and had anything to say. Not a complaint, not an ill word, not the only time, the closest thing that would be, would be sitting in while well, I'm sitting ringside with Jr. while they were in the ring and Matt Jackson, John at me from, from the ring while in the middle of, uh, uh, their first U S live show in long beach. And I'm just like, no, all right. I mean, kind of cowardly, but I don't know, man, something, something spun up with them in, in a way that, uh, you know, makes them want to act that act out in such a manner. So don't know. I mean, 
They always could have came up and just talked to me. <laughs> well, in wrestling, it's generally uh, the practice to go and just talk to other people and start rumors. That's the way I have found it. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Uh, I mean, it's uh, at the end of the day. It, I mean, people are asking me about this thing, but I, I think it was always more their problem than mine. Yeah, I never heard about it until people started bringing it up in the comments. Um, but thank you for addressing that, and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I'll let you close this off with whatever you want to say to, to end this. Thank you. Uh, follow me on Josh Barnett, Josh L. Barnett on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I also have a Facebook fan page um, at the uh, at, at, uh, at, uh, official Josh Barnett, I believe it is, but I'm, it's pretty easy to find. And then uh, joshbarnett.com. That's the place for, for all that I'm up to. We have uh, links to my BJJ Fanatics uh, technique DVDs. Um, also, I have uh, things available through scientificwrestling.com. And I have the most metal merch in all of combat sports. So head on over to joshbarnett.com. Get yourself some kick-ass metal gear. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV.